20% of this world is desert. That's 21 million square miles. And we have the opportunity here at Shuttleworth to study so many arid species. And one of the amazing groups of those species are the lizards. And we have here the lovely Australasian Aki small monitors. That's the dwarf monitor species. And they're so busy and active, it allows students to look at their behaviours and nutrition and other requirements. In fact, here at Shuttleworth, we have a wonderful opportunity with working with such a wide range of animals. It's a great pleasure to gain experiences working with those species. In fact, we look at the nutrition, the, the behaviours, and also we look at artificial incubation and also training methods of these species to support them within a captive environment. Here we have the Euromastic or Dab Lizard, which is a wonderful species of lizard that can often be seen excavating in the sand, thrashing its tail about to ward off predators. This is the oscillated Euromastic that has amazing coloration. The coloration is there to attract the females during mating season. The Euromastic very rarely drinks. It gets most of the moisture from the food that it feeds on, which are seeds, pulses and raw vegetation. In the wild, Euromastics spend a lot of time basking in the North African sunlight. This is the African Varanus white-throated monitor. It's a large carnivorous lizard that uses his forked tongue to taste the air while hunting prey. Currently an Appendix 2 listed species for being endangered, making it an offence to trade this species without a permit. Unlike the white-throated monitor, the Australasian blue-tongued skink uses its tongue to ward off predators. This one has inflated its body as part of its defence mode. In the desert fringes of the Caribbean islands bordering the Indian Ocean, you find the Jurassic rhinoceros iguana. This reptile feeds on vegetation and we provide a histolic approach including cacti and other Caribbean foods. Here is Ross, our horticultural technician, advising us. So Ross, here we are with this wonderful collection of cacti and looking at desert species, it's always extremely important to consider the foliage of, uh, of, the, of the desert. And what is absolutely fantastic is that there's such a range that can also be used when it comes to commercially feeding animals. So then there are some plants that we can cultivate and use as, as animal feed commercially. And I think you've got some here today, Ross. Well, I have. Um, a main one we use for um, cultivation for people and animals is um, the Apuntia. So stuff like the prickly pear, you may well know it as. Um, it's quite a brilliant plant, really. It's um, very adaptable to its climate, its conditions. And um, commercially, we use it. We use the pads, we use the fruit, we use the whole plant. And we can use it for feeding animals as fodder, the fruit's quite delicious. I believe this is quite an invasive species around the world. Well it is, because um, Apuntias and most cacti are only actually native to North and South America, but um, during sort of the 18 and 1900s, um, they were actually exported to Australia, South Africa, India, where the conditions were so good, they actually managed to crowd out the local uh, flora and um, yeah, at one point, I think there was about 100 million acres of these just covering Australia, crowding out all the native stuff, and it was just too good at its job. 
That's absolutely amazing to think about how a cacti can spread. Do you think these plants have developed their own method of, of defense or protection? And we've been looking at protection, particularly with a spider that can, that can shed its hairs. And these species, although they may not be able to shed their hairs, they've got some interesting protection. Well, they have. They've got actually a slightly similar method to that. They um, do have hairs, in fact. So stuff like this, uh, Puntia microdasis, um, has these hair-like um, spines, which if you brush up against them, they'll embed in the skin and they're very uncomfortable to both people and animals. So, and basically, if an animal's caught by one of those, it's not going to want to have a go at eating the whole thing. So it's quite a clever defensive mechanism to avoid being eaten. And others go one step further and have these massive spines that you can't even get near the plant and you don't want, if, uh, animals, for example, don't want to get one of those spines in the nose or anything like that, so they'll just move on for something a little bit easier, to be honest. Okay. So, with regards to cultivating cacti for animals to feed on and for exhibitions in enclosures, obviously we have to take all of these considerations into, uh, in, into the aspect of designing the enclosure. But what, what species would you recommend? Or do you well, we'd probably go for something along the lines of the Apuntia ficus indiana, which um, is very popular. It's got these large pads, there's not very many spines on it. Um, they've got a very high water content, they're about 88% water. They're um, very high in um, calcium, which can be very good if you're sort of rearing tortoises. So how successful are they to generate and to regenerate, if you like, in, in, in the UK environment or under artificial conditions? Well, normally, uh, the main issue is the uh, water, actually, more than the temperature. They're quite hardy if you can keep them dry. So a lot of the time, we'll grow them under glass, keep the water, temp uh, the water levels down. And other than that, they're fairly robust plants. They've been found up mountains. They grow as far north as Canada. So they're, they're fairly happy in most environments if you can keep them dry, really. That's really interesting and uh, inspiring to hear about the wide range of cacti uh, that, that are potentially very valuable for maintaining species here and we can see where the aloe industry needs to work with the animal industry yeah. to make this happen. Right. Thank you. Here we have the attractive red-footed tortoises that are housed with the rhinoceros iguanas. We are able to do this as they share the same habitat in the wild. At Shuttleworth College we've been very successful at breeding pancake tortoises. Here is Chris inspecting one of our eggs. The incubation of the pancake tortoise will take 90 to 120 days. During this period the shell is distorted and after hatching the tortoise will regain its natural shape after 48 hours. Here we have two of our captive bred Pancake tortoises, bred here at Shuttleworth College. The pancake tortoise is an endangered species that is protected by law and requires microchipping and registration from DEFRA. The pancake tortoise is appropriately named because of its very flat appearance. The top part of the shell is called the carapace and the bottom part of the shell is called the plastron. And these tortoises have adapted in a fascinating way where they can wedge themselves between rocks and they can inflate their shells which can prevent them from being dislodged from these rocks by predators. Here is our breeding female exploring her environment. The female pancake tortoise excavates a hole. She will deposit two eggs and release some body fluid. This allows the eggs to remain moist during incubation.
The Skelter Pustic, or Glass Lizard, is an Eastern European species, a very unusual limbless lizard. You'd be forgiven for thinking this was a snake. The eyes have eyelids and the tongue is mammalian-like. These lizards feed on a range of small mammals, birds and invertebrates. The ecdysis, or shedding of skin, is shedding pieces rather than one whole complete skin, like you see in snakes, allowing the lizards to grow. This leads us to the false coral snake curled in a defensive position. This snake in the wild has been documented feeding on the venomous scolopendra, showing no side effects to the venom. The East African sand boa is an oviviparous species with females giving birth of up to 14 young. This snake spends most of its life submerged in the sand with the tip of its nose out waiting for passing prey and can withstand temperatures of 60 to 100 degrees. Here is the unique hognose snake using its upturned nose to root about hunting for prey in the sand. In the wild these snakes feed on frogs and small lizards. In captivity, as they are reluctant to feed, it is necessary to scent mark the food with fish oil or the mucus of amphibians. The robust keeled shaped scales of the hognose snake allows extra protection from the sun rays of the desert. Here we see the natural belly scales of the snake and cloacal opening. Below the cloacal opening we consider to be the tail of the snake. The snake scent marks his surroundings and you can see the cloacal opening where the male will mark his territory. Here we have a pair of hog noses. It is interesting to see them rooting about with the turned up noses. Hog noses are really popular with herpetologists and have been bred in many colour forms and mutations. And here we have the naturally sourced or commonly seen western hognose alongside the albino mutation. This snake is often causing great discussion about the venom potency. Although no venom gland is present, the hognose does have toxic saliva produced in the duvenoid's gland in the rear of the mouth. Bites to humans can occasionally cause local swelling but are not dangerous. Here we have a bird-eating spider from the Brachypelma family in a defensive position. The red-kneed Mexican bird-eating spider uses its hind legs to flick barb urticanic hairs which are an irritant to predators' eyes and respiratory system.
Here we can see the finger-like appendages known as spinnerets on the abdomen, used for web making or in the males transferring the sperm. Here we have the cluster of eyes that allow orbital vision. And here are the pidipal which are used to control the food when feeding. 